I've shared my testimony with you a number of times about the fact that I learned how to study the Bible with a man on the radio who every morning would invite me to get on the Bible bus. His name was Dr. J. Vernon McGee. So this morning, I, I want to borrow from the way that he taught me, and I want to introduce where we're headed uh, in Genesis chapter 18, and I'll go up to the helm in just a moment, but I want you to step into the text with me. I want you, I want you to get on the Bible bus with me for just a moment. And I want us to press our face against the window, and I don't want you to see the terrain of where we're headed through contemporary eyes. I don't want you to see it through National Geographic or some of the latest reports of CNN or Fox News from Israel. So I want you to pray this prayer with me, and I want you to pray it out loud. Father, open my eyes to see beyond the natural, that I might hear with my eyes of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So come on, get on the bus with me. We are in the southern plain of the Jordan Valley. And as the bus makes its way down this in plain, I, I don't want you to see the Middle East like you would think of it today. This is, this is before the rebellion of Israel. This is before God had to remove Israel in rebellion and what we call the diaspora. He had to scatter them to the four corners of the earth. The, the land was filled with promise and power and potential and it's not the dry, cracked, barren ground that you now see that's so prevalent in that area. It was rich with thick green grass. You smell the air for just a moment. Just roll the window down. Push the window down on the bus and let the air come in on the Bible bus. Do you smell it? It's, it's, it's a fragrance of honey. It's the promised land. It's, it's the sweetest honey you've ever smelt, the if, if you can't catch a whiff of the honey coming out of the hives that dot the land, can you smell the fragrance of the beautiful flowers that Jesus would talk about later, that even in all of his glory, Solomon has never been arraigned. It's purples and yellows and reds and brilliant, brilliant multitude. It's a, it's a, in a cornucopia of explosion on the hills. Like little cotton balls, look out the window, they're beautiful fleeced. Sheep feeding on the grass. Be, be still just a moment as the bus comes to a stop. Come on, get off the bus with me. You put your feet in the cool grass that's thicker than any carpet you've ever been on. Can, can you hear it? It's the rhythm of water bouncing off the rocks from brooks that are coming down through the Jordan Valley and watering this incredible promised land. Just, just over to our right, we spot something. It's, it's a beautiful tent. I see because we read the Bible in Americanized, Westernized minds, it's not a Coleman, not a Coleman tent. This is not the one you had a horrible time with when the rain came and it leaked. This is unlike any tent you can imagine. It's a Bedouin tent. In fact, it's not just some Coleman dull green or some, some boring khaki. It, it's filled with color and, and it's, it's, it's a menagerie of majesty. And, it's, and, and if you look, if you look, there's other tents all around it and sheep are grazing and people are laughing and having a good time. And there's somebody sitting just outside one of the main tents and he's playing an instrument and they're dancing and singing psalms unto the Lord. We press in for just a moment and we look under an oak where the main tent's sitting and there's, there's an old man sitting there. You can look at him and tell he's got wisdom, awry headed. He's weathered from being a pilgrim, but he's full of life because there's a promise in his heart. His name's Abraham. We stand there for a moment and we take in all of the sights and the smells and 
There's something fresh cooking on the Bedouin grill. It's lamb chops. Our mouths water for a moment. And in contrast, we look off as the valley goes deep and we see a metropolitan area. It, it's a hub. There's five cities, but there's only two that you need to know about this morning for the sake of what we're going to learn. There's just two that you really want to know about. One, one is called Gomorrah and the other is synonymous with sin. It's, it's synonymous with tragedy and agony and depravity. It's called Sodom. And it's in stark contrast to this pastoral scene where they're singing psalms to the Lord and tending to the flock and enjoying the fullness of the land. In the valley, we see the hustle and bustle of this cosmopolitan hub of, of depravity. And, and just outside the main gate, we see a man we recognize, but he, 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 he doesn't have the same joy of the Lord. There's no song in his heart. Now, he's obviously a potentate. He's a man of power and prosperity because he's sitting in the gate. He's, he's a man of authority. When the text says, and he sat in the gate, it meant that he was the highest elected official in the land. We, we look back up the veil and we see Abraham sitting inside the tent door. We look down the, into the valley and we see Lot sitting in the gate of the city. For the last month, we've had an emphasis on missions, both locally, regionally, ultimately globally. This morning, my charge is to put the bowl on the box, and I, I'm, I'm going to present to you what I believe the Lord said is the greatest mission field of all. And I'm not taking away from the beauty and the majesty and the obedience and the power of what we've witnessed locally, regionally, and globally. I'm just simply saying, if we're going to do any of those right, this is the one mission field we got to get right. And I believe the greatest mission field in this house in this city and in this nation is the mission field of the home. It's got to be the home. So what we're going to do for just a moment is, is I'm going to challenge the men, not just the husbands, not just dads, but men. And there is no confusion in this house about male and female. Now, I know the women are going to say, oh, good, I'll check my Facebook. Wait a minute, we're never going to be the men of God that we need to be if you're not covering us in prayer. So what I want to do for just a moment is I'm, I'm going to go to Genesis 18 and Genesis 19 and we're going to contrast two men. One is by the name of Abram and the other is by the name of Lot. They're both believers. They're, they both have accepted the promise of Yahshua Messiah. They have both walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, signed a card, followed the Lord in faith. They are both without any question in heaven today. But the only reason we even know that Lot's in heaven is because we, we get to the, to the text and ultimately to the Apostle Peter's commentary who says that... And, Lot, just Lot in the King James, meaning this, righteous Lot, saved Lot. See, here's the challenge, gentlemen. What we're going to look at for just a moment is in contrasting these two lives, we see an incredible parallel to where we're living today. So take your copy of God's Word, and if you're ready, say amen. And I want you to rise out of reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, an authoritative word. We're going to begin our reading. I'm going to set the tenor and the tone in the first couple of verses of chapter 19, and then we're going to move to the first couple of verses in chapter 18. Look with me, if you would, at chapter 18. Then the Lord appeared to him, that would be Abram, Abraham, uh, by the terebinth tree in Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I'll bring a morsel of bread, and you may refresh your hearts 
After that, you may pass by in as much as you have come to your servant. And they said, do as you have said. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as you take your seat ever so quickly. Now, gentlemen and ladies, sons and daughters, husbands and dads, husbands that want to be, dads that would like to be, I want you to take notes. And if you're not taking notes, guess what I want you to do? Take notes. I'm going to lay out a couple of contrasts that are, that, are, that are just in continual evidence of the infallibility, the power of God's Word to transcend time. We are separated by millennia from this text. Our culture is completely different. The times are in so many ways completely divorced from what's happening here. Yet through the power of the word of God, it's able to step up off the page, set down in our hearts, and instruct us in these last days with some of the most powerful, profitable truths that I believe uh, we're, we're going to hear um, from this particular chapter. Now, here, here's contrast number one. We're going to break it down just like we're studying the word of God in our private praise and prayer time. I want you to notice first the difference in who came to visit Abraham and who arrived at Sodom. Now, now let the text do the talking. Verse, uh, chapter 19, uh, 18 and verse 1. Then the Lord appeared to him, to Abram, by the terebinth tree in Mamre, and he was setting. Now, for the sake of time, let me tell you what's going on. Because we're talking about who came to visit Abram. The Lord and two angels come by his tent. When you get to the text in Genesis 19, the Bible says very clearly two angels came to visit Lot. Now here's, here's the deal. There are places in our lives spiritually as pilgrims, which the New Testament calls us, when we're supposed to be in continual motion and movement and mission with the Father. But because we've become carnal or complacent or indifferent to the things of God, We've moved into a place that we were never called to go to. Every one of us have done it. In fact, if I had time this morning, I'd show you, I'd prove to you, Abraham is not an exception with one exception. When he moved to a place he wasn't supposed to, for example, Egypt, famine strikes, and instead of trusting God to open up the windows of heaven and feed his family, he packs them up and moves to Egypt. And when he comes out of Egypt, which is a picture of the world, he comes out with many possessions. And, and it's not the possessions that were the problem. It was that it had turned the heart of his people. Lot, on the other hand, as they come out of Egypt, Lot comes out of Egypt, but Egypt never comes out of Lot. Here's what probably happened. If you'll engage me for a moment with your sanctified imagination, it's justifiable. It's easy for us to do this. There are times when in our walk with the Lord, he will very intentionally come by to minister in a special way. Now, we've been taught as Americans, as Western Christians, that this is a book of information and perhaps uh, infallible uh, theology, but, it, but God doesn't speak anymore in a, in a personal manner. He doesn't, he doesn't speak to us beyond the logos. There's no rhema word. I'm telling you, beloved, that God sent his son, the word of God, in order to speak to us first by the wooing of his Holy Spirit that we might become sons and daughters. And what parent would pay the price he paid for us at Calvary and then have nothing else to say to us? Us outside of an academic document that never comes alive. That's not just a book. And there are times when, when if we're in the right place and we've not become calcified in our carnality, listen to the reasoning. It's very obvious. I mean, at some point, Lot just said, listen, I, 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 Uncle Abraham, I, I've got to tell you, I, I, I've been talking with Mrs. Lot and and the kids are so busy. The girls are now playing travel soccer. And we, we're constantly going down to Sodom. I, you know, first it was the super Walmart. And, and we could stock up. And, 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 but then they put in a target. And I'm telling you, we're putting miles on that camel like you wouldn't believe. We're just constantly down there. And every time I look up, she's having to load up. And then they put in a TJ Maxx. And I'm just telling you, we are, we are on our second camel this year. And it's just good stewardship for us to move. Move to Sodom. Now watch the difference. It's not just who visited. There's a difference. The, the, the text is very specific. It, it's, it's how. 
The Lord comes by to see Abraham, who's living in a tent, which is the picture of an evangelist who's traveling the land to share the promise of Messiah. But only angels come to minister to Lot. Because there are times when our sin is so offensive and so abrasive and God cannot, he cannot deal with our rebellion because he's holy. There are times when he wants to come by and minister in a way, but he can't. Now, how do you know that? Because I want you to notice not only, not only the, the who came to visit, but I want you to notice how they came. You do know there's no accident in the word of God. Nothing's incidental. God didn't look at the Bible one day and say, oh, I wonder how that got in there. Everything in this book is there intentionally. And like a diamond, it will step up off that page and the Holy Spirit will put an illuminating power of his light on it and it will become a multifaceted truth. Now, now listen to the text. Listen to the text. Not only who they visited, only the Lord went, only the Lord visited Abram. Two angels visited with Lot. There are times when you have to be careful. In fact, we're admonished. Be aware that there are seasons. Be careful, Hebrews says, for you entertain angels sometimes. Now, that makes Baptists itch in places they didn't know they had. Now, I don't think there's any candidates in this room, but there are times when angels show up. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not just the who. It's, it's, it's the how. Now, now listen to it. It's, it's there right in front of us if we have eyes to see it. Verse 3 of chapter 18, listen to Abraham's response when he senses the Lord's in his presence. He says, um, don't pass by your servant. Now, now listen to Lot because we're contrasting. Chapter 19, verse 2. When, when he discerns that he's in the presence of the supernatural, he says in verse 2, hey, you guys come on in and, and you rest. I'm going to extend the, the hospitality, but then you can go on your way. Marinate on it a minute because here's what happens. You get in a service like this and the Spirit of God comes by and he stops at the door of your tent. You do know we are tents inhabited by the Holy Ghost of God. This is a tabernacle. There is, there is no need to go to Israel, to the Temple Mount. There's no need to go to a building fashioned with hands. We are the tabernacle of God. Inside of us lives the one that hovered over the dark and the depth and, and the nothingness and spoke everything into being. Inside of us is the very one that stood outside that tomb that held the body of our Savior and said to that stone, roll that thing away and tell him to get up with all power and glory. That same spirit that hovered over the Shekinah, over the, over the glory seat of the, of the Ark of the Covenant, that's the same one that lives inside of me and you. There are times when the Lord will come and manifest himself in such a way through a word, through a song, through, through something that is supernatural in its capacity, but because we've become so settled in Sodom, this is what we say. Um, come on in, but then you need to be on your way. Abraham has a total different, total different response. Please don't pass by my tent. I, I am of the opinion that though we are in the most agonizing, unthinkable situation that none of us could have fathomed, that are of the generation that saw this nation in a different situation not many years ago. Do, do you? Can I pause and say this to you? Do you realize there are two, two generational divisions in this country now? That you have, you have a generation, which is essentially um, in some ways my children, that do not recognize America before 9-11. They have very, there is a complete generation that never knew what it was to stand in an airport and watch somebody get off without being, without being checked, patted down, or going through security that's, that's, that's superior to a maximum super, uh, uh, prison place. They, they stood at the ramp and waited and rejoiced when their loved one came home. They, they, there is a generation that's never been to school. They didn't go through metal detectors or they didn't have to practice lockdowns because there was a shooter in the house. Now there 
there is a generation that is quickly coming on the scene. Let's think about this. There is a generation coming that will think that the mask is a normal part of our experience, that pandemics are just something. We've got this variant and that variant and this booster shot and that vaccine. You have the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. As if the church, for the love of God, didn't have enough to disagree over, now we've entered into mass, non-mass, vaccinated, non-vaccinated. Have you had your booster? Because you're probably not of God if you didn't. There are times when the Holy Spirit is, is shouting and passing by. And the church has become so, so rigorous in her routine and so ritualistic in her programs that when the Spirit comes and, 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 and walks by, there are times when we say, listen, we're, we're on standard Baptist time. You, you do what you need to do, but we got to go. You know one of the joys in heaven is there's no clocks, no calendars. You, listen, when you get one of them snot-slinging Holy Ghost times like we've had this morning, you can stay 10,000 years and not even get hungry. Isn't that going to be something? It's not, it's not it, listen to me, it's, it's, it's not just that how he came. It's not just who came. Here's the third one. Y'all get anything out of what I'm saying? Well, what's the contrast? Very quickly, what's the contrast? We're almost done. No, notice the spiritual significance of when. These two men were visited. Again, the text never, there's nothing incidental or accidental. Chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And the Lord visited Abraham in the early afternoon. Hmm. Now, verse 1 of chapter 19, in contrasting Lot, said that the two angels came to him in the evening. There are some dads in this room that God's wanting to do something supernatural in your family. Pressed down, shaken, running over. But because you prefer the darkness over the light, how is it that Abraham, in the light of the day, had a visitation from the Lord? Because when the light of the world came into men, men rejected the light because they preferred darkness. You and I are children of the light, not of darkness. Now, that's one of the reasons that, that, that bars are dark and, and their biggest business is at night. That's not accidental. Number one, when the lights come on, they don't look near as good as you thought they did. <laughs> Say amen. The holiest people I've been around all week. And number two, when last call comes and they flip the lights on, they scramble like cockroaches because they don't like the light. You, you, watch, you watch a man who begins to sense God passing by the door or coming by his gate. He's set in his prosperity. He, he's set in his position. He's a man of authority. He's some man of acclaim. He knows he's supposed to be out there as a pilgrim sharing the gospel and being mobile and flexible with the Spirit of God. He has been with Uncle Abraham. He watched God speak over them. That which was dead in her womb is now about to become life more than the stars in the skies and the sands upon the shores of the sea. He has seen God do the impossible, the absolute unthinkable, but he's more comfortable in Sodom. It, it's not accidental that when they receive their visitation, it's a picture of where they are spiritually. There's times when God has to break. There's times when people will ask, will you pray for us? And, I, and, and, and it's not often, but it does happen. There are times when I have to obey the Spirit of God and say, I cannot pray for healing because this sickness is not from the enemy. It's by the divine hand of the Father. He has put you flat of your back so that you will look up. He's not trying to wound you. He's trying to heal you. He's trying to get a hold of you physically to make you understand that you've grown comfortable at the gate of Sodom. You're offended. You're mad. You've lost your joy. Over at the tent, they're singing songs of Zion. Over at the city, they're, they're, they're singing the songs of the bar. Over at the tent, Abraham's raising up spiritual sons. Down at the gate, Lot can't even, he can't even muster up enough testimony for his children. The contrast is astounding. It's because we've discovered that where they're sitting has such a powerful message. One's in the door of the tent. One's in the gate of the city. And what's amazing, if we had time, we would discover that Abraham's the most powerful, prosperous, 
individual in that whole region. In fact, if I could show you from the text, which I'm not going to take time to do, he just single-handedly whipped the single greatest five military um, coalitions in that area and rescued Lot from the very people that he's now gone back to. Mom and Dad, there are times, listen to me, ma'am, there are times when you need to quit praying that God make the pig pen a comfortable place. And you need to ask God in his mercy to break that he may bless. Well, I want you to notice what it costs a lot. If you would, look at chapter 19, verse 12. The men said to Lot, have you anyone else in, in, in this city? And he said, well, I've got some son-in-laws and daughters and some sons and daughters. and uh, Anyone you have in the city, you need to bring them out of the place for we are about to destroy the place because the outcry of the Lord against its people has become great before the Lord. The Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went up and said to his son-in-laws, who, uh, who were uh, to marry his daughters, get up, get out of this place. I want you to listen to what they say to him. He tells them the Lord's about to destroy the city. But they, he seemed, Lot seemed to his son-in-laws to be jesting. He, he had become so comfortable living outside of the power and the presence and the purpose of God's will for his life that when it came time to tell his children, we're at the end. The city's about to be destroyed. He had no credibility left. There are, there are dads that know more about their children's athletic schedule than they do their spiritual state. There, there are dads who can sit down and talk hours, endless hours, about hunting or fishing or ball games or basketball. Or, or, or some, someone jokingly said to me this week, Preacher, um, it, is, it, it, it is not... John Fulkerson, it is John Fulkerson. It's not Josh Fulkerson who's coming, it's John. <laughs> okay, number one, he plays basketball. I don't know if y'all know this, but I've never really had an affinity for it. <laughs> and his coach is not Nick Barnes. <laughs> okay, can I just tell you something? I don't care. I I'm bringing Nick, Rick, John, Josh, Joseph, Janie, whoever he is, I'm bringing him for one single solitary purpose because he loves Jesus. And whatever I got to put on the hook to help you understand this, that if you're sitting in the gate of Sodom and your sons and daughters can't even tell that Jesus is on you enough that when you say to them, something's sifting in this nation, something is woefully wrong, and they jest and say, well, now, wait a minute, Dad. You know, I don't know because you ain't never really talked about Jesus. Other than Sunday when you get the Bible out of the back of the car and greet the preacher like you're Billy Graham. Y'all all right today? I'm in a good mood. We're talking about missions. Y'all with me today? Where, where does this start? Where, where did this, what happened? Because that, that's really the question. I, I'm going to give this to you very quickly. And, and, and You studied in your own time. Why, why are they following such radical different paths of lives? Why, why is it that when it comes time to share, the city is going down, we're about to die. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. I, I cannot say this enough to you. There are some of you that are toying with eternity. You're playing with it. You, you, Sunday after Sunday, we sit here in utter amazement at what God's doing in our midst. It is not because that he has to have Fairview. Do you understand that? It is because we're at the bottom of the ninth. We are in the last moments of the last hours of the last days. He is shouting from the balcony of glory. And the church in America is the most anemic, ineffective, sitting at the gate. We're fussing, fighting, offended. We, 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 we are completely distracted with the circus of Sodom instead of the power of God. Listen, listen to me. Next, next Sunday, I'm going to invite you to join 
join Chris and I. I'm not, I'm not going to extort. I'm not going to manipulate. I'm simply going ex, to extend an invitation because this is our conviction. We are fully convinced that we are soon and very soon going home in what's called the rapture of the church. Now, being a part of this church, a member, walking that aisle, praying a prayer, getting in a baptistry or a trough is not going to get you in the rapture. If you are not washed in the blood of the Lamb, I don't care if you're a Catholic or a Mormon. I don't care if you're a Baptist or a Methodist. If you are not a born-again child of God who's been washed in the Lamb uh, in the blood of the Lamb and your name is not on the Lamb's book of life, you are not going to a place called glory. I don't need to offend you. It is an offense. It's called the gospel. Next week, I'm going to extend an invitation. I'm going to ask you to come out of, out of the gate of the city and, 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 and become aware of what's happening. Let me, let me just give you an anecdotal, anecdotal piece of, of, of information. It's interesting that while I'm standing in this helm preaching the word of God, that on the 16th anniversary, on the 16th anniversary and from 2005, George W. Bush, who decided in his own arrogance because he did not have a biblical worldview. He's a professing believer, but let me explain something to you. If you don't have a biblical worldview, you have no problem killing the unborn. God calls them children, not a choice. If you don't have a biblical worldview, you have no problem dividing the nation of Israel. George W. Bush sent his Secretary of State over to Israel to say, you will adopt a two-state nation. We're going to divide the, the, the country of Israel. On 16 years ago, on this weekend, a little obscure storm jumped over the, the, the handle of Florida, hit the warm waters of the Gulf, and while the Prime Minister was in the Oval Office saying to George W. Bush, you need to leave the land alone. While preachers were begging and saying, George W., you need to get out of the gate of Sodom as a believer and come back to the tent of Abraham. He who touches Israel is touching the apple of God's eye. You divide the land, God's going to divide you. And he jested and said, it's just a piece of real estate. It has nothing to do with God. That's what happens when you don't let this book be your first and final authority. 16 years ago, Katrina absolutely decimated a place called New Orleans and everything inside. It is just coincidental that our president, who by the way, slept through his meeting with the current prime minister. He slept through his meeting. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. That's not political. It's factual. If your president can't stay awake long enough to talk to the prime minister from God's piece of land, you need to give him a monster drink. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yesterday, he met with the prime minister, uh, Mr. Naftali Beninete, who's the new prime minister, and he said to him, we're withdrawing all support. We will not help you keep the Iron Dome. Iran is preparing already. Within, they're within less than 60 days of a nuclear warhead threatening to wipe out Israel. If you do not divide the land and adopt a two-state solution, we're pulling all of our funding. Boy, it's, it's coincidental that the Prime Minister, 16 years to the day, there is a Cat 5 walking through our Gulf getting ready to hit, hit New Orleans again. You do not mess with God's people. You understand that? Where does this nonsense start? How do you move as a man of faith, mobile and flexible, and raising your children in the righteousness and the holiness of God, loving your wife as Christ loved the church, always moving with God in the Spirit, to just setting yourself up as a potentate in the gate of Sodom? I'll tell you where. I'll give you the cleft notes because we're going to end on a high note. When they come out of Egypt, Genesis chapter 13 God had to beat the Abraham out of Abraham. The Bible says in chapter 13, when Abraham came out of Egypt in repentance, now listen carefully, and I'm going to paraphrase, but I'm close, that Abraham went back to the, his beginning at a place called Bethel, Bethel, Beth house, El of God. Is it interesting to you that we are in the single greatest attack on the collective church in the history of America that's moving people out of the bet L, the house of God? Abraham went back to Bethel, the house of God. The text says he built an altar, but if you study the text, and, and, and listen, I'm open to correction. I'm open, I'm open, and some of you will. And I'm okay with it. But I think the text in the Hebrew says, though Lot was with him, 
Lot's focus was on his possessions, and he didn't go to Bethel nor the altar, but he went to take care of his prosperity that he brought out of Egypt. Listen carefully. By the end of chapter 18, God's going to say to Abraham who said, don't pass me by. Y'all remember that old song? Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. You see him sitting there. He's been waiting 19 years. He tried in his own flesh. And he, he, birthed, he birthed an Ishmael. And they've been fighting ever since. That's a two-stage solution. They're trying to give Israel to the Ishmaelites. He doesn't belong to the Ishmaelites. He belongs to the Isaacs. He's sitting there going, don't, don't, don't pass me by. I, I, I don't know what it was about Sunday the 29th of August, but something happened and I was, I was sitting in the gate and I, I was just going to do the religious thing, but something happened and God walked by and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Please don't leave me in Sodom. By the end of chapter 18, this is what God says to Abraham. Hey, by the way, your wife's going to conceive. <laughs> and you've got to read it because God's got a sense of humor. Look to the person next to you and say, God really has a sense of humor. <laughs> Just look at him. You'll get it. <laughs> this is what he said. He said, uh, hey, Abraham, because you invited me in, read the rest of the chapter. Because you invited me in, I've got to tell you something. Uh, your wife, who's a member of the AARP, <laughs> is going to the nursery. <laughs> In chapter 18, listen to me. I really believe what, what the Lord was doing that moment was passing by his tent door to say, can I trust you with this boy? Have you got enough sense have you got enough spiritual discernment? Are you being lured to Sodom? Are you listening to the newscast and the politicians and the pollsters? Are you listening to, to all of the pundits who are saying that's, a, that's, a, that's an antiquated, backwoods, Bible-thumping, bloody book and you can't trust it because science trumps it? No, science doesn't trump it. If it weren't for God, we wouldn't have science. Amen. Amen. Can I come here? Hey, Abraham, can I trust you? Abraham said, oh, don't you come in? Stay with me. Stay with me. He sits down, the Lord does, and he sees the stench of Sodom. And he says to his two angels, go down there. I'm going to stay here and tell Abraham and Sarah, she's going to be pregnant. And Sarah laughs. <laughs> she said, you old fool. I'm not going to get pregnant. And he said, baby, you already are. We just believe in God for it. Now watch the end of chapter 19. We're done. Watch this. Abraham responds to the Spirit of God and gets everything God's ever promised him. Lot keeps his heart in Sodom and loses everything He's God. He lost his children, his wife, his possessions, and he ends up in a cave doing something that is unspeakable because his daughters get him drunk. Listen carefully. When the Holy Spirit of God bids you come, Come on. And you say, no, I just want you to do what you need to do and get out. You will end up with a false seed and spirit that will never produce the promise of God. Today, today, man of God, your greatest mission is your home. 
come out of Sodom. Come to the tent. Because it's just about home going time. Next week, Christy and I are going to invite you to join us in a fasting season. Brother Mike, will you make your way? We're going to open up the altar. Jesus Christ, the promised seed, when he came, he fulfilled the first four feasts on the Hebrew calendar. He was crucified on Passover, not before it, not after it, but at the very moment they were cutting the throat of the Passover lamb, he died that moment. He was buried, he was resurrected three days later. Pure, un, he fulfilled the, un, the feast of unleavened bread. He was resurrected on first fruits. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit came and formed the church, us. He fulfilled them in chronological sequence. Now, next week, I'm going to show you because there is a breakthrough in the Hebrew world because the Hebrews have moved back to, to Israel in record number and they believe they're on the brink of taking the Temple Mount and they have the temple ready to be erected and they believe that Messiah is coming, not back, but for the first time. Now, in their breakthrough, because we as Westerners didn't understand the fullness of the feast and we Americanized them, we've, we've imposed some things on them. And we've made statements like this. Well, the Bible says no man knoweth the hour, the day or the hour. That's true. But we've completely misrepresented what it said. And if you go out of here and say next week, Brother Jeff's talking, he's going to tell everybody when the rapture is, I'm coming to your house. <laughs> now, if I get raptured, you stay at your house. <laughs> Listen to me. If he fulfilled the first four in chronological sequence to the biblical T, the next one, that starts on September the 6th. Chris and I are going on Hebrew standard time we're, because we believe that's where God's calendar, that he said, Ezekiel 5, 5, I've set, I've set the times by Israel. We're going to start our fasting time to go into the Feast of Trumpets because I believe the Feast of Trumpets is the time, the season, when he's going to call the church home. Now, I didn't say 2021. Now, did anybody hear me say that? Did you hear me say that? I didn't say that. But if it happens, y'all come see me up there. I'll be at the throne. But how close are we? So do you want to be called home from the tent door or the city gate? Do you want God to say, come on home and you run? Or do you want to say, boy, I'd like to stay one more day here. <laughs> Not me. You need to get that settled this morning. In Jesus' name, it's time to get it settled. Would you rise in authority? We're going to pray over this room. There are men in this room that are lost. You're going to hell. You know enough about God to be miserable and in hell. You know enough about religion, but you've never experienced redemption. I'm begging you in Jesus' name. I cannot save you, but we can introduce you to the one who can. There's some, there's some guys who need to come back to Bethel. You need to, you need to come back to God. You need, you need to come to the altar. Die to yourself and die to Sodom. You know who you are. You know what the Spirit's saying. Father, in Jesus' name, we stand in authority. And I'm simply asking, Father, not for an emotional moment or movement. I'm asking for a, a valid, legitimate moving of your Spirit. Messages like this are not born out of the practice of preaching. They are birthed out of an alarm that says, get, get ready, bride. Get ready, church. So God, speak to us as husbands, as dads, as sons, as brothers. Are we sitting at the door of the tent or at the gate of the city? Spirit of the living God, do what only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Altars are open. Pastors are waiting. Please don't grieve the Holy Spirit.